In this segment, we're going to talk about dependency parsing, but what we're going to start with is lexicalized parsing. So if we have the sentence, the dog ran to the house, this is the syntactic uh, constituency analysis of that, where each constituent has been annotated with its head word. So again, the head word is the most important word in that segment, and so in a noun phrase like the dog, um, the noun dog is the most important piece. All right, so one thing we can think about is the fact that this sort of induces relationships between particular words independent of the actual constituency structure. And here's what I mean by that. We are taking the house and combining that into a unit, this noun phrase that's noun phrase headed by house. And we're saying that house is the most important unit in this noun phrase. And so in some sense, what we can do is we can think of the as being kind of subsidiary to house in this case, or modifying it. All right, so following this intuition up the tree, we can kind of think of this to, the, to house, uh, this to NP combining into a prepositional phrase, to is the most important unit. And so house ends up being subsidiary to that. And so we can draw these arrows from between the words kind of ignoring what's actually going on in the syntactic constituents here. And this is the idea behind dependency parsing. If we apply the same idea going up the tree, we can produce a structure of basically words kind of pointing to each other, expressing relationships between them at this low level without introducing any of these notions like noun phrases or verb phrases or whatever. And this gives us the rough skeleton of dependency parsing or dependency syntax. So this is a syntactic formalism that doesn't introduce these non-terminal symbols, but instead defines the structure through these relationships or arcs between words. Uh, and so the terminology we use is we say that uh, a head word uh, or a parent or a governor is connected to a dependent, a child, or a modifier. So house and the, for example, house is the head uh, and the is the dependent or child. Each word has exactly one parent except for the root symbol, uh, which doesn't have a parent, and the dependencies have to form a DAG. So we cannot have, uh, we cannot have cycles here. So the you know, if, if we want to kind of anchor this in stuff that we've seen before, the part of speech tags are the same as, uh, well, what we saw with part of speech tagging and then also with uh, constituency parsing. And a lot of times what you do in a dependency parser is actually run a tagger first as a pre-processing step. Historically, that's how a lot of the parsers worked. Okay, so it looks like we've kind of thrown out the notion of hierarchy that we had before, but I want to emphasize that this actually isn't in some way so different from constituency parsing. Um, if we kind of draw out the tree like this, I've thrown out the root symbol here. What we could see is that uh, if we look at the subtrees, we roughly recover the constituents that we had before. So for example, the subtree rooted at dog, uh, it contains the dog, and dog is a noun. So we could say, okay, there's some big phrase here and it's headed by a noun. All right, we're not calling it a noun phrase in this case, but that's basically what it is. And similarly for to the, to the house, that's a, that's a subtree uh, rooted at two. And so it's rooted at a preposition. All right, you know, it's not a prepositional phrase, but essentially it is. The one constituent that we're missing here is the verb phrase. And so dependency syntax does not uh, kind of posit the existence of a verb phrase in the same way. Um, instead, the, uh, in this case, um, subject and indirect object of this verb are both kind of treated symmetrically. So that's one big difference representationally between what's going on in dependencies and what's going on in constituency. All right, so the one piece where we haven't shown and we're not gonna talk about that much are labels here. Uh, so we can label these dependencies according to their syntactic function. Um, a lot of these labels are not very creative. For example, a determiner modifying a noun phrase, that gets the determiner label. Um, a noun modifying a verb, well, in, there are actually a few different labels here. This one's a subject, so the 
label here actually does say something about the grammatical role. Um, preposition label, um, object of the preposition, um, and determiner again. So many of these are kind of very easily determined based in a pretty shallow way based on uh, just the tags of the head and the modifier. So uh, the major ambiguity that we're going to think about resolving is the structure. Um, and if, what, if, if you want to assign labels to these, a lot of times what you can do is just take the structure and then run a classifier at the end. So well, yeah, we're not going to worry about the labels too much when thinking about dependencies here, and I'm going to drop them from uh, the slides. All right, so thinking about how this contrasts with constituency, um, there are kind of pros and cons of both formalisms. So in this prepositional phrase example, uh, ate the cake with a spoon, in constituency, it was sort of complicated how this actually worked, right? Um, we had these rules kind of rearranging in this fairly major way. Uh, several of these rule productions had to change and kind of be reordered. We do get the same VP goes to VBD NP rule in both cases, but it's in a different position now with respect to everything, and um, it's just sort of a big change. In dependency, instead we are making a much more direct decision about which is the parent of with. So with a spoon is, is going to be our quote unquote prepositional phrase. Um, and then does with attach to cake, in which case it's the you know cake having the spoon on it or whatever. Um, or does it attach to eight, in which case it modifies the event. This makes a lot more sense. All right, so now we're going to see a case where constituency kind of wins. When we think about this dogs and houses and cats example, um, the way that uh, this coordination works is a, the presence of a ternary, ternary rule. NP goes to NP, CC, NP. And this makes sense for representing this kind of coordination. In dependency, the first item that it, of the coordinated structure is the head. And then the and is a child of that, and then uh, the other item is also a child. So for example, if we have this phrase dogs in houses and cats, uh, dogs is going to be the head of that whole phrase. Doesn't necessarily make sense as a kind of representative word, right? Because we actually have two things that are being combined. If we have Mary and Joe, just saying that Mary is the head of this phrase doesn't really reflect the fact that there's actually two people involved, right? Um, so this is a place where dependencies kind of do something a little bit weird. So th this is to illustrate that these are different formalisms, even if a lot of times the way they represent things is sort of isomorphic and you could map back and forth between them. It's not always true. So let me kind of illustrate why dependencies might be something that we're interested in. Uh, and the reason is that they can be a little bit more of a direct lens into predicate argument structure, and they can be useful for tasks like relation extraction. So, for example, uh, we have the sentence, bills on ports and immigration were submitted by Senator Brownback, Republican of Kansas. So we have the so-called standard dependency representation on the left, and we have a collapsed representation called Stanford dependencies on the right. And so we have these kind of cool uh, effects here where uh, we've taken this preposition of on the right, Republican of Kansas, and kind of folded it into uh, the label on the dependency arc. And we also have this bills on ports and immigration. We've kind of post-processed this to make something a little bit more sensible. Um, and so now we can see very directly that we have this submitted event that's going on at the top here, and we have uh, a few different uh, kind of arguments to it. Um, one of them is the agent. So this is a linguistic term for basically uh, kind of representing the argument of a particular verb, like who's doing it. So Senator Brownback, Republican of Kansas, is doing this, uh, you know, kind of doing this, and uh, then you have the other arguments of submitted as well. So this is exposing a little bit more easily than constituency does uh, this idea of uh, kind of this who did what to whom view of events. 
All right, another big win for dependencies is going to be their ability to represent stuff cross-lingually. Um, so there's a very cool project called the Universal Dependencies Project that is using a canonical set of tags and labels and annotating dependencies across a whole bunch of different languages. So I think they're up to 70 or, or more languages now. And the reason that this is doing uh, this project is using dependencies is because these dependencies are more portable cross-lingually. Um, we've talked about how uh, constituency really kind of depends very heavily on the word order. And when you have free word order, constituency doesn't handle that very well. And so a language like Czech, where you can rearrange the words a little bit more freely than you can in English, um, is not well handled by uh, standard constituency representations. So this, what this shows is that this kind of uh, this, this kind of technique can generalize to lots of languages other than English, and the kinds of parsers that we're going to build can then uh, parse in these other languages as well, given the fact that we have labeled data for them. All right, the last thing I'm going to talk about is the idea of projectivity, um, which again is something that shows up primarily in languages other than English. So a tree is what we call projective, if any subtree of it is a contiguous span of the sentence. And all the trees we've seen so far have been projective. And you know, another way to think about this is we kind of draw these dependency structures and we don't have any crossing arcs. What would a crossing arc look like? Here's an example of that in a non-projective tree. A hearing is scheduled on the issue today. You see that uh, this basically there are two arcs here that are crossing uh, well, okay, there's a couple of points where arcs are crossing each other. Um, and uh, the basically what's going on here is that we can't write this in this, this kind of linear structure um, anymore. We have to, uh, or we, we can't write this in this, we can't draw this in this projective way. We, we need to draw the arcs and they end up crossing each other. Um, so the way to make this sentence non-projective would be to write a hearing on the issue is scheduled today. Um, if you kind of do that rearrangement, you remove this sort of problematic arc that goes from uh, hearing to on, and uh, it turns out this, this all kind of end up, ends up working out. Um, but uh, basically because of this phenomenon that we see here, which by the way is called extra position, where uh, on the issue gets kind of extracted from where it sort of should be with respect to the hearing, um, we end up with a non-projective structure. Uh, so this, that's kind of a weird example in English, uh, but there are plenty of examples in other languages where this shows up. Here's an example in Swiss German, um, where basically if someone is saying that we helped Hans paint the house, that's what this, sub, the, this kind of piece of the sentence looks like um, with what's called a gloss here, where you, we see a kind of word-by-word -word translation. And so this is, uh, this is some, some fairly, this can be fairly common in other languages. For, for example, roughly a quarter of sentences in Czech are non-projective. And so we are going to primarily talk about algorithms for projective dependency parsing, but it's important to think about how these algorithms can generalize and, and handle these cases in other languages. And by the way, these are exactly the kind of cases which constituency has a very hard time representing, and so they kind of motivate our choice of dependency to begin with. So this gives you a kind of idea of the considerations behind the dependency formalism that we've been developing uh, and maybe some of the linguistic ideas that go into it so we can understand um, why the parses that we're going to produce from our dependency parsers that we'll build end up being useful. That's the end of the segment.